Okay, so this chat is on about how we can borrow some ideas from a kitchen and use them in the brewery to help uh, to help establish great brewing practices that are easy to follow. So my name is Kyle. I am the owner of Gorman and Smith Beverage Equipment, and I do a little bit of equipment sales and a little bit of consulting in Canada. And I, my goal is to help breweries make more beer efficiently and at a better quality. My background is in biochemical and environmental process engineering from the University of Western Ontario. I am a master's of science candidate at uh, Harriet Watt, and I've also been trained by both the Master Brewers Association and BJCP. So the overview for this talk is we're gonna start with a recipe. We're gonna look at the workplace, how this affects our equipment, how we can store ingredients, and then how to keep a tidy workplace. So this all stems from the fact in the last year and a bit in Canada, uh, brewers are starting to be uh, put in the same type of regulations for food safety as Amer like as uh, food pr producers, so like restaurants and bakeries and those sort of businesses. And traditionally in the United States and Canada, most of the laws for alcohol and regulations for alcohol come from a very different place of food regulations. So few food regulations stem from uh, consumer protection, specifically in the meat and dairy industries. And this was started uh, from the work of Up Upton Sinclair and his book, The Jungle, where he uh, looked at the meat slaughterhouses in Chicago, I believe, and people were so disgusted about the, the how these slaughterhouses were run that they, they pushed the government in order to introduce no, new legislature, and then Canada followed suit shortly thereafter, and they have increased their uh, legislature since then. So Canadians have a much higher degree of food safety and control than most American jurisdictions do. But on the flip side, uh, after prohibition in both Canada and the U.S., um, alcohol laws came from a more of a controlled substances base. So they weren't necessarily for consumer protection. They were more of a drug-based um, legislature. So it depend because we had this split between alcohol products and non-alcohol products, uh, the, the rules and regulations for both these types of products was um, divided at about the, in the 1920s and the 1930s, depending where you are. So in Canada and in some jurisdictions uh, elsewhere, the basic, basic requirements for alcohol is what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to trace back. So this means keeping records of your lock codes and suppliers. You need to be able to identify and document. So that would be batch and packaging laws. And you need to be able to trace forward. So this would be date codes and customers sold. This was already really common here. So uh, you could not sell alcohol to a bar unless they had a valid liquor license and you had to record that liquor license within your own accounting books, uh, proving that they met the requirements to sell alcohol um, as a service. So when do you need to do more than this? This is what happens when you need to have more requirements or more re like paperwork and more procedures. And those rules are pretty much the most basic that you need in a retail environment or if you're shipping across uh, a border so that you can pick up a product in another jurisdiction, another state, another province and say, oh, this, this package was made on this date and then that can or bottle can be connected to uh, grain codes, to yeast codes, and it's basically making sure that if there's ever a recall required, which can be really expensive, that they can track down all of the pieces of that packaging date. Stricter programs may be necessary if you are looking at brewing organic certified products. So you'd have to ensure that your, your suppliers are all organic certified as well. You'd also have to look at if you're sharing a space with a restaurant or industrial kitchen because they have stricter requirements than the brewery does typically. So you're going to have to follow the stricter kitchen requirements. You're gonna also have to look at supplying, if you're supplying the spent grain 
or tired ingredients, like if you're giving the spent grain to a bakery, for example, for them to make bread with it, you might have to have stricter requirements and showing your, the steps and how you're treating the spent grain before releasing it to the public or other companies. So we're starting off with a recipe. This is basically the mise en place type of procedure that a bar or a restaurant would use. So we should look at borrowing some of their ideas so that we can run our brew days a little bit more efficiently. So this, we should have a base recipe and this is a little bit more than just a brew log because if we make a mistake on the brew day or we have to do a substitution on the brew day and then we go back to it and not realize that that change occurred, we could be using a mistake and pushing it forward. So we want to have a base recipe that we're following and these should be updated as critical changes occur. But we want to have basically almost like a standard operating procedure on how to make a certain product. This should also allow for secondary data in the brew sheets of where the malt and adjuncts are coming from, the hops, the water and salts, yeast, process aids, so that would be any enzymes that you happen to be using, that would be filtration aids, that would be uh, nutrients, that would be um, coagulants, so whirl flock, and then any other ingredients, so few, few purees, ex, like hop extracts, um, those sort of things. So we want to make sure that we're recording where we are getting our ingredients from to make sure that we can identify where the problems are coming from should they occur. So these recipes should be written to reduce the amount of work for the brewer during the brew day. For example, I am working with a distillery and I use the enzyme math to basically say, oh no, I want this much enzyme and it's a round even number to measure. So it's not like 825 milliliters, it's, it's rounded up slightly so that it's a nice even measurement. So it's easy to remember and easy to make sure that we're adding the proper amount. We want to be able to provide spots for lock codes or date packaging codes or whatever code that that product has in our brew logs or the ingredient source. So for example, if it's just municipal water, you just say, yep, we use municipal water. It was treated, the carbon was treated, uh, was changed out this long ago. There are lots of options to digitize all this. Um, the most simple is just like a Google, Google Sheets or a cloud-based Excel sheet. That's the most basic, but there is, um, software available that can really help with this, this task. So one good idea to have is a product profile. This is gonna help tie your back of house staff to your front of house staff. So it's basically saying a single page and it's outlining the type of product. So it's the product type, the appearance, the aroma, the taste, the finish. It's basically like a, a dating profile for this product so that if you give this sheet to your bartenders or your sales reps, they'll immediately know the type of customer that they should try to use this pro product for. This is gonna help your brewer know what beer to make and help your sales team describe that beer to their customers because sales teams can't really read recipes. They won't understand the different malts and how they affect the end product. They won't know that necessarily know the hop varieties and that's just because they haven't been trained in those areas. And on the flip side, your brewers might not quite know the customer types. So if you can get one document to outline both of those, it will really help your inter company communication. Workplace. So, we want to prepare by cleaning everything, sanitizing everything. We want to have clean, nice workplaces. Uh, fruit flies are notorious for building up in a brewery, so we want to make sure we scrub down all the surfaces and keep everything clean so we don't get a fly infestation. We want to have easy access to garbage disposal. We want to remove unnecessary items from tabletops. Uh, the law of horizontal services is that horizontal services are going to uh, create clutter. Uh, more clutter mean, makes it a harder workplace to work in. So if we want to clear those at the end of the day, make, make sure that they have a nice shelf, do that every day, it's going to make our job a lot easier. The, another big part of a workspace is, is what is called a good manufacturing process. So there's actually a great resource from the Brewers Association that outlines this document very well and it covers things such as uh, personnel, the brewery and grounds, operations, facility and controls, equipment, 
production and processes, and warehousing distribution. So it basically breaks down a brewery into these seven areas, and it gives you tips and tricks on how to effectively manage each area to a high degree. There's a, an, a step further, and this is more common in food manufacturing than it is in breweries, and this is a HACEP program. So this is a hazard analysis critical control point program, and what this does is it will uh, basically look at where there are problem areas in the brewery and in order to reduce the control hazards. So for example, in a bakery, if you have nuts in one packaging area and one process area, you wanna remove that completely from the nut free area so that you know that your uh, products that are supposed to be of a certain type don't have those allergens inside. Allergens are a serious problem in food manufacturing. And unfortunately, most breweries don't take the same degree of care when it comes to allergens. So equipment. So in a, in a kitchen, this would be preheating the oven. In a brewery, this means making sure we have plenty of hot liquor tanks so at the right temperature. So this means making sure it's full the night before so that it heats up overnight, depending on how our equipment is designed. We want to make sure all the equipment is cleaned beforehand. It's a lot easier to clean when the brew house is still hot and uh, it doesn't have the solids dried on the equipment. So we also want to sanitize and pressurize our fermenter on brew day so that if it's pressurized and it's holding a couple pounds of pressure, we know that it is not going to have any bacteria inside. Uh, a step further on the equipment section is we want to have a plan for continual small improvements in a brewery and we want to be able to divide tasks based on a frequency level. If you need a quick little chart on how to approach this, I happen to have one that I can email you. So it just divides things on a batch, a week, a month, a quarter, and an annual basis. Some things have to, have, have to happen every batch, like cleaning the fermenter with caustic or some things should only be checked every quarter, like checking the glycol levels and concentrations in your glycol chiller sometimes, or you could do that monthly. Um, quarterly would also be like changing the chemicals from a, a caustic to an acid bath in your keg washer. So it's small things like this where you, wanna, you don't wanna do them all the time, but you do need to make sure that they're done on a periodic basis. A helpful piece of advice in terms of equipment maintenance is you should have a battle plan for all of your equipment. So this is basically going to be a binder where you have the manuals for the original equipment, you have your technicians for that equipment that are the local suppliers, so that say your boiler is giving you an odd alarm, you open up the binder, you go to the boiler and say, hey, this is potentially the problem. This is who we call when we have this problem. And then the next, if when you fix and diagnose, you take a simple sheet, you write, jot down some notes and say, hey, this is what we did last time. When we had this problem come up, this is how we fixed it. So that, for example, if you run into a problem and the boiler technician shows and you pay him several hundred dollars for the visit, he outlines how to fix that problem, and then you don't have to call the technician the next time, so you save that service fee. Ingredients. So, it is important to measure out and count the ingredients before you start. I know so many breweries that operate that they just basically say, "Oh, we're um, we're probably fine. We'll just make the brewery make the beer this way," and then they realize like the day, the afternoon before or the morning of, they're like, "Crap, we don't have this type of hop in our inventory. Um, we're not quite sure what happened to it. Maybe we needed to double dose on the previous batch or something like that." And then they're out. If you count out and designate and mark the ingredients for that production batch ahead of time, you know you will have everything in advance. This is gonna save a lot of stress on production days, it's gonna save a lot of money and it's a lot of time because if you do this ahead of time, you don't have to go around running around finding the ingredients the day of. I had a customer that not too long ago, they uh, didn't realize that they were out of rice hulls and they figured a shipment would come in and it was literally like they were in the middle of uh, mashing in when they realized they had no rice hulls. They had to go to the local homebrew store and buy them by one pound bags, which became significantly more expensive than the $20, 30 the, the entire bag is worth. Milling might affect your schedule if you have to 
uh, use a third-party service to mill or mill with another brewery or even just getting your seller men to mill everything in advance. It can take an hour. It can take two hours to get that mill, depending on how you're doing things. You want to make sure that it's, it's good to go so that when it comes to the brew day, you're just dumping things in. If you're doing things in line, you have to just be cognizant of the fact that it could take an hour to mill all the ingredients beforehand. You want to prepare your water salt additions. So you can get water measuring equipment. It's about $1,000 to buy that equipment. Or you can send your water to a test service in order to uh, take the sample in, in advance. And then you can use um, brewing software or water calculation software to determine how to add your water salts. And you should measure this out in advance as well. Uh, it's a lot easier to make sure that you have everything on in little little bowls and you just go dump, 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 and then everything's done. You want to verify your hop charges. Alpha acids can change the amount of bitterness used per batch depending where they are in the process. Um, if you're just doing a dry hop addition, it might not be as important to split up those batches in terms of hop weights and alpha acids. But if you are bittering charges, you're still looking for a comparable IBU level uh, batch batch. So just doing the math ahead of time instead of the, in the middle of the boil will save you a lot of stress in brewing. Double checking that you have all these ingredients and you're good to go. Uh, it saves you a lot of headaches. It saves a lot of stress. It saves a lot of money. If you know that you're going to be doing a certain schedule, you can save a lot of headaches ahead of time. Storage. So properly storing ingredients will help increase the overall quality of the beer. It can save money and reduce spoilage. The number of times I've walked into a, a, a f like a product fridge and I've just seen open bags of hops just sitting there um, is mind boggling. So if you can either buy smaller bags from your hop supplier, if they'll allow it so that you're only using what you need per batch. If you want to buy like a vacuum sealer for larger bags, that's a great alternative. Uh, if you even just keeping your bag your grains um, in a dry environment, they'll help produce the chance of mildew or mold or rodents. Um, just by properly storing in all these ingredients in a good, either dry or clean environment is going to make sure that you will have great tasting beer. A great example of this is if you have a deep fryer in your kitchen, you want to keep the deep fryer and the exhaust from the kitchen on a completely separate system and completely away from your grain. The the aroma from the deep fryer will permeate into the grain and your beer will smell like bad french fries. So the simplest rule is first in, first out. You use the oldest material first. You put it in the position where you can always take the oldest material and you should know where and when the ingredients come from. Uh, you don't need to you know, know where every little barley corn comes from, but you should know the supplier and you should know how to fix that problem. For example, uh, a customer of mine was shipped stale yeast. It happened to be a couple of bricks that were expired. Because they knew where those yeast bricks were purchased from, they were able to contact the manufacturer or the supplier and get new yeast bricks um, at no cost because of that switch up. So, if, but if you don't know where you're buying things from, and you don't have that communication, it can uh, be very tricky to resolve those issues in a cost-friendly manner. Ingredients and handling. So properly handling the ingredients after storage can help make better beer. So that's making sure that you're using the proper tools and the proper ingredients and the proper um, storage environments. Even if you're just making sure that the buckets are clean before you measure clean and dry before using them. Doing this the proper way ahead of time will make sure you're not putting bad flavors or bad ingredients into the beer. We want to make sure everything's nice and dry and clean and otherwise we could be putting in mildew or mold or some, the re bad things into the beer. So if we everything's clean and dry and put away properly then we will be making great beer every time. Using the proper tools can help reduce labor and increase safety. So what I mean by that is if you're using high quality tools and high quality um, equipment, uh, you're going to save a lot of trouble down the road. I once had to clean, pull apart a centrifugal pump and what had happened was they were using kind of like home hardware type 
tools in their brew house. And what had happened was a chip from either a shovel or something like that um, ended up in between the impeller and the faceplate of the pump and it tore it apart. And this was all caused because they bought a hardware tool, tool instead of a proper food handling tool. Obviously we wanna clean while we brew as best as we can. So obviously not everything can be cleaned while the brew house is hot. So if we wanna just push things quickly through and uh, make sure that we get a quick flush of everything when we can, the easier it is gonna to be to clean at a later date. Doing short hot flushes after we push part, uh, beer through a line is gonna help clean it. And we wanna check with our chemical supplier for best practices. So for example, plants and food, it's gonna need a caustic base. So most of our cleaning is gonna be done with a, an alkaline cleaner of some sort. For beer stone or rust or any of those things, we wanna use an acid. So that'll either be like nitric or phosphoric acid or a blend of the two or something, or even citric acid and sometimes. So if we go and do our homework ahead of time and communicate with suppliers ahead of time, we'll be able to get the most effective cleaning action in our equipment. So as a whole, we looked at how to set up a great recipe. We looked at the workplace on how to build ourselves a good working environment. We looked at the equipment on how to properly set up our equipment so that we are producing in a quick and fast way, how to store ingredients and handle them, and then trying to clean as fast as possible. So I have a couple of little pieces of homework that you can apply in your brewery really quickly. We want to give tools specific jobs. And we already do this to some extent in our home kitchen. So we have different knives in a butcher's block. So we have a bread knife and we have like steak knives and then we have a chef's knife. Those tools have specific jobs and we don't change them up. The reason why I say this is because if you use a piece of equipment that uh, is used for multiple pieces of this the process, you could be introducing contaminants from one part of the process to the other. So if we say, nope, this is gonna be used for this job and only this job, we know we're never going to be cross-contaminating. So for example, we could say, we want a certain set of tools for the mill, we want a certain set of tools for the brew house, we want a certain set of tools for the tap room. So that way we know that the spray bottles that the front of house staff are not being confused with the sanitizer spray bottles in uh, with PAA in the brewery. This just makes sure that we know we're not putting um, something that's designed for tables into our, our brewery. We also wanna reduce the amount of hardware store tools that we're purchasing because mild steel will damage stainless. So if we get a, if we scratch it the wrong way, or if we get a little piece in, just like that pump I mentioned earlier, we will end up damaging our stainless and reducing the effective life of our equipment. Plastics pieces, if they're not designed for a food handling environment, can break down and end up in the product. Uh, a common example is Boonham gaskets. Uh, if they're not properly rated, they will eventually break down into particulate and that will end up in microplastics in our beer, which is horrible. So we wanna use our proper tools and we wanna use our proper uh, materials for brewing environment. So one easy way of splitting up the knowing where tools belong in our brewery is to use color coding practices. So we want to just keep it simple. So we want to use as few colors as possible to make it easy to remember. We want to pick contrasting colors. So a tool that is completely different than the product is really easy to spot. So blue, for example, is a really rare color in food. There's only a couple things that are naturally blue. So if we're in one process, part of the process, and we want to decide we want to use a blue tool, we can use it and pick point and see it. We want to keep the tools for the similar area the same color, and we don't want to mix, mix and match tools with their handles. We also want to try and roll it out at the same time. That reduces training. And I would say put up laminated signs next to where the tools are stored to remember where, where all the tools belong. 
if we do all these steps, then it's going to be really easy to know where something belongs in the brewery and how it should be organized. So a little bit more about myself. What I do is I help people with their planning. So I either do help with their initial build or their expansion plan. I can help with design and sourcing of their brew house cellar and replacement parts. And then I can also look at your product and process. So we can either create new ideas or evaluate your classes. Some small things that I'm helping run with the conference is uh, I, I've been able to negotiate better shipping terms with some of my partners so that I'm able to offer free shipping across US and Canada with orders over $250 Canadian. Uh, specifically for this conference, I'm offering a 10% discount if you're a new customer. And if you are looking at implementing color coding products into your brewery, one product that is unique to my catalog that is not offered online anywhere are color-coded EPDM gaskets. They are a little bit more expensive, but they were actually, I developed these because multiple breweries had asked me to develop these so that they could handle their barrel aging programs uh, easily and make sure that their barrel aged products did not come in contact with their clean products. So again, my name is Kyle and I own Gorman Smith Beverage Equipment. My website is www.gormansmith.com. You can, you're free to shoot me an email at K-Y-L-E at G-O-R-M-A-N-S-M-I-T-H.com. Here are some more reading on how to uh, go into some details on these sort of topics. So for example, the Brewer's Journal here in Canada talks about traceability. Uh, Hendo and I talked with Andrew on a discussion before about rapid product development on how to get products into your pipeline faster. And we use a couple of the ideas in that talk that I discussed earlier. And then finally, my blog has a lot of information. Whenever I do a chat with craft beer professionals, I will go into further detail on that blog. And that's pretty much the end of the talk. I'm going to give a couple of minutes to see if anyone has any questions and see if anyone wants any specific answers to some of the things I've talked about. Okay, it doesn't seem like anyone has any questions. If you do at a later date, feel free to shoot me an email or we'll figure something out over the webcam or something like that. These are kind of just a quick and dirty guideline to get started and uh, hopefully you can have some success implementing these at your facility in the near future. Cheers.